Thanks. Great, looking good. Thank you again so much, John, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we will be finally kicking off the presentation, so sorry for the delay again. Um, but today we will be talking about social engineering attacks, what they are and how to prevent them. Um, I know I discussed a little of this before, but I just wanna go through the housekeeping again. Um, so we will be recording this webinar. So if we do run over time, if you guys need to hop off early or forward this on to any of your colleagues, um, you can expect to receive the recording within a day or so into your inbox. So keep an eye out for that. Also, um, John is a great resource. If you guys have any questions, if you wanna know anything else about anything he's reviewing, please enter those questions into the Q&A panel that can be found at the bottom of your screen. And we'll do our best to get to as many of those as we can. And if not, then we'll send those on and off and make sure um, you get the information you're looking for. And with that, I will hand it over for the long awaited presentation. Thank you, John. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. Thanks for everyone for their patience. Um, we'll get right into it to, to make up time here. Um, just to introduce myself, John Danino. I head up the sales engineering team for Barracuda. I um, have a background in SIM and SOC and technical sales and just thrilled to be here with everyone today. And uh, as mentioned, I think we have some really great content coming up. Um, we'll go through a little bit of a sort of background education on social engineering and phishing and things like that. Um, and then I think we have a really fantastic uh, attack or, or hacking demonstration to show uh, everyone on the line here today how these attacks work. I'm going to give you sort of a behind the scenes look at the types of tools and techniques that attackers use to carry out these um, social engineering and, and phishing type emails. So again, really, really great content coming up here. Okay, so jumping into it, attacks are becoming more severe and targeted among the wide variety of attack types. Respondents uh, to the data that Barracuda has collected, they say that their organizations have experienced denial of service, phishing and social engineering, and credential theft. Those are the ones that rank as the three most common. And it's important to note that as these, as these uh, malicious hackers they can combine some or all of these type of attacks into one. So for example, they may use phishing to access the credentials they need to breach the network and then deploy malware within the systems that enables them to steal that data or lock users out of the systems. And of course, uh, hold that, that data for, for ransom and demand that payment. So two thirds of organizations are affected by email based attacks. These attacks are not random, uh, at least not most of them. I'd say a, a large majority of them are really spear phishing attacks that employ some sort of personalized message to them. Um, these are social engineering attacks or other sophisticated methods. So hackers are using social engineering tactics to trick users into disclosing their login credentials, which are then used to get inside the network. And then once inside, as mentioned before, they can you know, spread laterally within the organization to other systems from a PC to a server, for example, and then compromising more valuable accounts or you know, uh, using it as a launch pad for other types of attacks, maybe monitoring some of the communications that are go, uh, going back and forth. Uh, between different email accounts or, or different um, computer systems. So I've used that term social engineering a couple of times now. What is social engineering? For anyone that's not familiar, social engineering is the psychological manipulation of people in the hopes of gaining access to confidential information or systems. It's really a form of, uh, form of a confidence trick or information gathering, uh, you know, fraud, system access, those sorts of things. And these attacks used in social engineering can be used to steal employees' confidential information or data. Uh, and the most common types of social engineering happens um, either via the, the phone, uh, also known as vishing or voice phishing. Uh, and of course, maybe the one we're most familiar with, uh, email. 
And other examples of social engineering attacks include criminals posing as service workers or technicians. So that way they go unnoticed when gaining access to the physical world, right? The physical site or physical business. Um, it goes back to sort of that, um, I guess it's a joke where you, you put on a, a neon vest and you hold a clipboard and you could kind of get into any building, you know, just you look like you're important, you look like you belong there. And, and a lot of the times uh, you know, folks through their emotions will will kind of just let you do if you ask for something they'll let you they'll let you write in um, based on based on that appearance. Okay, so common social engineering techniques. Uh, we'll break it down a little bit further here. Um, the ones that we see the most are business email compromise, so BEC. And this is an exploit where an attacker obtains access to a business email account and imitates the owner's identity in order to defraud a company, its employees, customers, partners, and so on. And this technique relies on the assumed trust between the victim and their email account. Again, you get access to an email account, you look like that person. It's more believable when you're sending or, or asking for you know wire transfer information and things like that, because it's sort of coming from a, a legitimate account that's been compromised. Uh, then you have spear phishing. So unlike re regular phishing attacks that are more random, spear phishing, as I mentioned this before, is highly targeted. Attackers are going to gain personal information about the victim to create a more convincing lure. If it's really detailed towards you, it's using your name or information that's that, that you know about, right? A conversation that happened previously, they're more likely to interact with that email. Uh, and then spoofing. So this technique involves impersonating a trusted entity to deceive victims into giving up sensitive information. And this can happen in a number of ways. Um, it could be uh, spoofing an email. So let's say it's uh, John Kelly at abccompany.com. Maybe someone creates uh, a new domain, John Kelly at abccompany.net, for example. Or maybe ABC Company uh, is the official email, but then someone. Uh, you know, does A, B and drops the C because it's already in company and it kind of, you know, you're not looking at these individual letters within an email address typically um, when you're, you know, dealing via email communication. Okay, uh, diving another step deeper there. So those are more sort of the high level ones. Now diving a little bit deeper onto the specific types of BEC attacks or the business email compromise attacks. Um, false invoice schemes. So companies with foreign suppliers are often targeted with this tactic, wherein attackers pretend to be the supplier requesting fund transfers for payments to an account owned by, of course, the, the fraudster, the attacker, the hacker. Um, we also have CEO fraud. This, this one I see becoming even more popular um, when we talk about AI. Uh, but but for CEO fraud, this is where attackers pose as the company CEO or really any executive and send an email to employees in finance requesting them to transfer money to the account uh, and so on. Um, but even more so like with uh, voice or vishing, voice phishing, um, we're seeing a lot of these fancy AI tools that can clone voices um, and they're cloning the CEO of a company's voice and then having them call an employee over the phone and uh, you know uh, ask for these wire transfer details and things like that. Uh, account compromise. So an executive or, or really any employee's email account is hacked and used to request invoice payments to a vendor listed within the email context. So again, compromising that email account, going to the contacts within the email account, and then sending it to those people that maybe they've already conversated with in the past. Uh, attorney impersonation, so an attacker will impersonate a lawyer or other representative from a, a law firm responsible for sensitive matters. Uh, and then finally, data theft. So um, think about uh, places like HR and, and bookkeeping. Employees will be targeted to obtain that personal and sensitive information from employees and executives. And that data that they're collecting, you know, do they, do they really care about, you know, 
addresses and phone numbers and things like that. Well, it's to use that data primarily in other attacks, again, to, to gain more info, to make the communication of the attack, the phishing email, even more convincing if, if you have that information uh, prior. All right, so let's go ahead and break down business email compromise, how it's done from a theoretical perspective. And then I'll, I'll show you live uh, via that attack that I was mentioning before. So let's take a look at this. So number one, the impersonation. So you can see the email is going to daniel at acme.org, A-C-M-E.org. But we could see the from address is, uh, the domain is different. It's acrne.net. Well, why did the attacker do that? Well, if you look at the C, at the lowercase r and the lowercase n, they're so close together and they sort of look like an M if you're looking at this very quickly. So these are the type of techniques that they use. They're, they're buying a domain that looks very similar to ACME and of course doing ACRNE with the R and the N looking like an M, very clever. Um, number two is creating a sense of urgency. Attackers love to do this. They don't want you to think <laughs> before you act. Um, so that's where things like, hey, I need you to do this right now. Um, I'm in an important meeting, right? The CEO is messaging you. They're in an important meeting. They want you to go and get some Walmart gift cards and, and send them the codes, right? Very, very common. So I'm sure a lot of us have, have seen that before. Um, and then finally, it's coming from an authority figure. So uh, in this case, it's from the CEO or the executive or uh, you know anything like that. Um, HR, they need the details now, uh, or if they don't get this information, they're not gonna be able to process payroll, for example. So there we go, mixing the two together. It's coming from HR, authority, and also creating a sense of urgency. If you don't give me this information now, nobody in the company is gonna get their paycheck this week. So. Um, so really, those are the, the three main things um, when we talk about business email compromise and the type of tactics and techniques that they're using. All right, so BEC phishing attack. Uh, how is this done? Well, it's really quite simple, and I'm going to demonstrate all of this in, in just a few moments. So one is creating a phishing website using open source tools. Uh, number two is sending a phishing email from a legitimate or perceived to be a legitimate address. Number three is capturing the target credentials. And number four is logging into the target account and creating an email forwarding rule. This is very common. Email forwarding rules, for anyone that's not familiar, when you get access to that account, attackers are going in. And in case they get kicked out, in order to maintain what we call persistence within the environment or the account, um, they're going to set up a rule that says any email that goes to this account that the attacker just compromised, it's also going to be forwarded to an outside address. And again, attacker will, attackers will do this to maintain persistence and uh, to really learn more information. Imagine if I could read all of your emails for weeks or even months uh, and, and gain that info and maybe uh, craft another targeted attack towards somebody else, maybe a higher level, higher level account or CEO's account or the IT administrator's account. You can kind of see how that would spiral out of control there. Okay, so let's attack. Um, what do we need? Again, we need that target and that sender. Uh, we need a good email format. Um, what I've seen before is attackers may email the, the sales team, right? Uh, sales at example.com and, and get a, a hungry salesperson to email back asking, hey, how can I help you? Um, and then that way they can see the format of the, the email or more specifically the, the signature at the uh, bottom of the email of that salesperson at the company. Uh, a good reputation organization with bad security. Of course, the attackers are going to go after the weakest links, the, the organizations that are not employing good security. Um, an authenticated email server, of course, to send our, our email. And then the ability to use things like Tor or you know the dark web or a way to hide our identity. 
uh, and also Bitcoin, because a lot of the times ransom payments are are done via cryptocurrency, uh, and they do that because it, in, in some cases it makes it harder to track, and others almost impossible uh, to get back or to track. And of course, how do we do all this? Um, there's tons of sources out there, um, you know, finding out open source information via LinkedIn or um, the the company's website, tools like Hunter.io, Google, Shodan, um, basic stuff like NS Lookup, um, you know, ton, tons of things out there to, to do this. Okay, so without further ado, let's actually uh, simulate one of these attacks. So I'm going to bring up one of my machines here. And you can see here, I have a phishing tool on the left side, and then I have uh, an email spoofing tool on the right. And you can see all the, the fields here. I could type in the from address. I'm going to impersonate Microsoft. I could even make it so that the email looks like it's coming from at Microsoft.com. I'm going to send this phishing email to Adam Jones at laxtext.net. So this is my victim. I have my subject line in here as a Microsoft invoice. And I even have a whole text here with the Microsoft logo saying, hey, here's your, here's your statement for the month for your 365 subscription. Go ahead and click the attachment to, to be able to see that bill. Um, but now I need a link. I need that phishing link that sort of phishing page where I'm going to capture the credentials. So you can see that tool has a whole bunch of options and I'm going to choose Microsoft. And we're going to give this a second to generate that link for me. Okay. So we have our phishing link from the tool. I'm going to copy that. And then you can see here, I'm going to highlight sign in to view. And I'm going to put that in as a hyperlink so to disguise the link just a little bit. If I really wanted to be fancy, I can buy a domain that looks like Microsoft. But for a quick, quick demo, this will do just fine. And you can see here, I'm going to also have the option uh, of attaching a document. And here I have uh, a file that I've named Microsoft Invoice uh, and uh, you could see it ends in a .pdf. So it looks like a PDF. Uh, stick around and, and, we'll, and we'll see if that is truly the case here. Of course, I'll hit send email and the email has been sent. So let's switch views. Let's go to the view of our victim, Adam Jones. You can see here, this is Adam's PC. He receives the email. It looks like it's coming from Microsoft. I can show that here. And Adam is going to click on sign in because he wants to view that invoice. So he's going to put in his credentials. Where's the password? And he'll click sign in. OK, uh, it brings us to an account recovery. Interesting. Uh, I wonder what happened there. Obviously, I'm playing along here. Um, so that didn't work. So Adam says, all right, I'll just download the, uh, the PDF that was attached. That also has my invoice details in it. And it's saying that the file can't be opened. OK, interesting. So I wasn't able to sign in. And, uh, and now I can't open the PDF. And if you look in the top left corner, it wasn't a PDF. It was a file uh, or a malicious file, in this case, a ransomware that was made to look like a benign PDF uh, invoice file. But if we're patient here, you could see, yep, all my files have been encrypted. They're no longer PDFs. I get the ransom note that says we have to pay all this money in Bitcoin. And switching back to the view of the attacker, I can see Adam Jones's email and I could see his uh, password here. Obviously, uh, don't do ABC1234. Um, but that's how they do it, right? They're able to use that tool. You click that link, you put in your credentials, and they could see exactly what you typed on the other end because they're controlling that session. 
So from there, uh, me as the attacker, I'm going to now use that information. So I'll go to the real Microsoft sign-in page, office.com, click sign in. And now I'm going to put in Adam Jones's username and also the password of PC12345. Okay. And we're in. So from there, I can then go to Outlook. And deep, in, sort of deep in the settings, if I go over there, open up more settings, this is where I could find what I was talking about before, which is the email forwarding rule. So again, any email that gets sent to Adam Jones's account is going to be forwarded to whatever email I put in here. And I'll just put in to the hacker at gmail.com. Okay, so now I'll get all of those emails forwarded to that Gmail address. Very, very common for this to happen whenever there's a BEC attack. Okay, so now I'm gonna do sort of a, a part two here. I've got a whole bunch of, uh, of these spoofing tools launched and it's gonna be the same thing, but I'm gonna do a massive attack on uh, laxtext.net. I'm gonna send it to the marketing team, uh, to info, to jobs at laxtext.net, just a whole bunch of them. And it's got the same the same email, same exact format. I basically just copy and pasted that. And that's also, it also has the uh, the same attachment there as well. So we'll start sending these off. about 10 of these that we'll send. So will be actually to everyone, all company at Laxtex. And one more. Okay, so all those have been sent. Now, something that we're going to talk about um, in just a few moments is defenses to this type of attack, to BEC and all the other ones that we talked about before. Um, and one of them is is monitoring. And that's where something like Barracuda can, can come into play with um, one of our XDR solutions. Um, and you can see there's sort of a central pane or a single pane of glass where we can see what happened. Um, in this case, all of those email messages were blocked. So I can click on that and see, yep, this one was going to Adam Jones, of course, this time having uh, Barracuda enabled. And if I go over to the alarm and alert section, so again, we have with our XDR solution, a 24-7, 365 security operations center. So real security folks in the seat that are monitoring for this type of stuff, for these type of attacks. And you could see here, there's a message for uh, advanced threat protection blocked malicious attachments multiple times. So this is saying, uh, breaking down exactly what the threat is. So what is the threat? Well, the Barracuda SOC has detected multiple emails attempting to deliver documents containing malicious software, but were blocked by ATP. Well, of course, that's exactly what just happened. There were multiple emails that attempted to deliver those uh, those supposed PDF attachments that were, of course, really, uh, really ransomware. Okay. So hopefully that was pretty insightful. Um, what can you do, right? These are some of the cybersecurity best practices. What can you do to enhance your cybersecurity posture? And one is using MFA and strong passwords. 
So multi-factor authentication, MFA, you might also see it as 2FA, two-factor authentication, adds an extra layer of security beyond just a password. So for anyone that's not familiar with MFA, you probably have used it before and might not even know it. Um, it's really, it, it's when you get prompted for uh, pr most cases, a six digit code, and that code is always rotating. And it might come in the form of a text message to your phone or an application like Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator. Um, so think back to our demo that we just showed. If the victim, Adam Jones, had MFA on their account, it would have been much harder for me to get in. I had the username, I had the password, but had MFA been set up, I would have also had to have gotten that as well. Now, MFA is not foolproof. There's certainly ways around it, but it significantly cuts down on the account compromises because it's all about making yourself um, uh, better than the next person, basically. If you have MFA, a lot of the times the attacker will kind of move on to a softer target. Um, they won't really waste their time trying to now brute force or get in uh, another way, uh, getting that, that uh, multi-factor code. Um, implementing an AI-based phishing protection solution. So artificial intelligence, of course, there's a lot of buzz around that now. Uh, that can help detect and prevent phishing attempts by analyzing patterns and identifying suspicious activities that might elude traditional security measures. So uh, the best example that I can think of this would be, let's say it was a plain text email. It did not contain any uh, links for the email security to scan. It did not contain any attachments to scan. It was just a plain text email saying, hey, I'm in a meeting right now. I need you to go get me gift cards and you know, text me the code at this phone number. Um, it's hard for traditional systems to detect that. So something that's artificial intelligence based can read that email and say, that doesn't look quite right. I should probably block that email. Um, configuring something called DMARC or domain-based message authentication uh, uh, reporting and uh, conformance. So this helps to protect against email spoofing. Remember we talked about spoofing before towards the beginning. Um, this is an enhanced filtering technique that can block those malicious emails. Again, pretending to be sort of another sending email server, if you will. Um, end user security awareness training. You know, end users are the weakest link. And of course, there's technology out there. Barracuda has a ton of it. Um, but also training the end users, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are potentially getting that email. And, and they really need to, of course, know about these different tactics and techniques and sort of the clues to look out for. And that brings us to the five tips to stop phishing. Um, don't click or <laughs> open any attachments unless you can verify the authenticity. Um, check things like the from address. Is it really coming from acme.org like we uh, demonstrated before? Uh, looking for pixelated images or uh, poor grammar and spelling. Verifying the sender over another medium. Were you expecting that email? Did it come out of the blue? Um, maybe we want to call that person. And then uh, finally, getting layers of protection. Uh, there's an industry term called defense in depth. There's no one solution out there. There's no one step you can take to, to stop this. Um, it really does have to be a, a multi-layered or defense in depth approach. If attackers get past one defense or one layer, um, there's another one to back that up. And it goes back to making yourself less vulnerable than the next person. If you have all of these protections in place, most likely um, attackers are going to move on to a softer target. I mentioned this uh, before and also showed it very briefly towards the end of our demonstration, um, but something like an XDR solution. So for those that want to go past the, the basic steps that we just covered, an extended detection and response solution like Barracuda XDR, that's really going to fortify your cybersecurity posture. So 
This is your holistic managed security service. We provide an all-encompassing security service that man manages many aspects of your cybersecurity needs. That comes with a 24-7, 365 security operations center that's doing that incident detection and incident response where we're actually calling you, letting you know about these things that we may see on your network, your email systems, your endpoint, for example. That centralized visibility, that dashboard that I was showing, all of that information from cloud applications like Microsoft 365, servers like Active Directory servers or file servers, network security like firewalls, ingesting those login, uh, that log information to look for someone hopping on the VPN, VPN from China or Russia, Endpoint security, is there ransomware running or did someone try to disable the antivirus? Of course, email security. Again, most targets are coming in via email. Are we collecting the logs from the gateway solution, the tool that's supposed to be filtering and correlating that with everything else, with the emails, with the servers, with the firewall and the cloud applications? That's how you get that centralized visibility when you're collecting all of that information in one place. Now, where does XDR fit into essential cybersecurity hygiene? We sort of have five steps to keep in mind. Um, one is establish what you want to protect. So what systems do you have? What data do you have? You need to know what you have in place so that way we can come up with a plan to, to better protect it, to fortify those systems, to make sure that data, that critical data doesn't get into the wrong hands. Step two is building concentric rings of security. That goes back to the defense in-depth model that I was talking about before. Um, and I bet a lot of you folks on the line today already employ uh, a lot of this. So for example, you have a firewall. That's one layer of defense. You might have uh, an antivirus solution on the endpoints. That's another layer to that. You might have an email filtering solution. Yet again, another layer of building concentric rings of security. Three and four is really where something like an XDR solution comes into play. So monitoring the environment. Think about the attack that I just demonstrated before in our demonstration. You need to know you have a problem in order to fix it. If you're not monitoring the email solution to let you know when something gets through, if you're not monitoring that firewall to know that a brute force has been done, if you're not monitoring Office 365, like the Outlook application, to know that an email forwarding rule has been configured, um, you're not going to be able to fix it. So monitoring is, is a key step there, and XDR can help with that. And right after that is reducing response time. So now that you're monitoring, you're looking for those brute force attacks, those email forwarding rules and so on, you now have a team like the Security Operations Center to respond. And you wanna respond in minutes, not weeks or months later. And on average, we see that most attacks go unnoticed if you're not monitoring for over 180 days. There's a lot of damage that can be done in 180 days. And then five, securing people, process, and technology. Um, yeah, where should you start? We always recommend choosing a framework. And there's a bunch out there, but a very popular and sort of uh, open source one, if you will, is NIST, N-I-S-T. Um, and these frameworks like NIST are going to break down what you should be focusing on, employing an AV solution, encrypting traffic, perimeter defense, uh, log monitoring, right? Ingesting logs from critical systems. Um, so pick a framework and that framework is going to guide you uh, through this sort of cybersecurity hygiene journey. Okay, so visibility through one platform. So Barracuda XDR's visibility allows customers to integrate their entire digital footprint into one platform. This is going to help consolidate across various tools, correlate events, apply things like threat intelligence, those indicators of compromise, basically, 
uh, with artificial intelligence and machine learning, coupled with that 24-7 security operations center that I mentioned before. And those folks are going to detect and respond to the attacks similar to the ones that we showed here today. And the entire security portfolio, again, it goes back to defense in depth, having those different layers. Um, of course, I won't read through all of these here, but the short of it is, is that Barracuda can absolutely help with that defense in depth strategy, whether it's things like Microsoft 365 protection, securing their perimeter with uh, things like zero trust, uh, firewalls, uh, things like that application security, endpoint security, and user training, making sure those users aren't clicking on the emails that they shouldn't, and also sales tools. So our sales tools are designed to empower your go-to-market strategies with things like a vulnerability manager, security scanner, uh, white labelable sales collateral, and comprehensive support. So this isn't a, a go at it alone strategy. Um, we're going to be there uh, helping you along the way with all of the solutions that you see on the screen here. All right. Awesome. Uh, I think, Kate, you're going to jump in and talk about next steps. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, John. It's always so crazy to see how almost easy it is for those hackers to get in and create those forwarding rules, but it, it's very interesting to see it firsthand. So thanks for running us through that live demo and explaining um, some of the step, steps and measures people can take to ensure that doesn't happen to their customers. Um, as John mentioned, some next steps for you guys. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the solutions that he mentioned, such as Barracuda XDR, or have any other questions, um, want to see a more in-depth demo, please feel free to reach out. And if you're interested in more information um, on some of the driving forces be behind um, some of these cyber attacks, uh, feel free to take a look at the Cybernomics 101 report, which we recently published. I just sent the link for that in the chat. Um, it's, it's very insightful. I definitely suggest you guys uh, give that a quick read through if you are able. Um, and then if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide, John. Um, thank you. Um, I'm before we move into the Q and A, which is coming up next. So if you guys do have any remaining questions, please feel free to enter those into the Q and A. I did want to launch a quick survey and tell you a little more about next week's celebration. So next week um, on June 6th, next Thursday, we will be having Global MSP Day, which is a day designed to celebrate all of the hard work that MSPs do to protect all of their customers. So to celebrate that, we are going to be bringing together some of the top experts in the MSP industry for a virtual event. Um, where they will talk through some of the hot topics, such as how AI is impacting cybersecurity, um, how to mask your vendor relationships, how to improve your cyber hygiene, um, and also providing some marketing tips to help drive some new business. So if you're interested in any of that, or if you can't make it on that day, please feel free to register anyways, and we'll make sure to send you the um, annual report, the evolving um, um, landscape of the MSB business following the um, event. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to that. Appreciate all of your responses on the feedback survey. Again, apologies for the uh, technical difficulties. And with that, I will hand it over to John. Um, I think we have a couple questions in there, but please feel yep. free to enter some more in if you have any. Yep. Um, so we had one comment and then one question uh, sim around the similar topic, and that was MFA. So um, uh, one of the comments was, no MFA, Adam, question mark. Uh, and then the other uh, question was, what if this account that you hacked had MFA set up already? Would you be able to access the account in that case? So a uh, great comment and, and great question. 
Uh, the answer to that is um, it, it, yes, you should have MFA enabled. Um, there's tons of statistics out there. I think one by Google or, or Microsoft, of course, one of the big players that it cuts down on 98% uh, of account compromise. Um, so yes, have MFA. We didn't have it in this demonstration, but you absolutely should. Can you still get in even if there is MFA? The answer to that question is absolutely. <laughs> there are plenty of ways. In fact, there's an entire book. Um, I believe it's called Hacking MFA. I, I don't remember the, the author, um, but I'm sure if you Google that, you'll find it. Uh, tons of ways to get around multi-factor authentication. So enable it. It's great. It cuts down on account compromise, but um, it's not foolproof. In fact, um, we do have a demonstration here at Barracuda that uh, shows attackers getting around MFA, the sort of tools and techniques. Um, so if anybody is really uh, interested, I would love, I could personally hop on a, on a call with you and show you that attack. Uh, and of course, show you how Barracuda uh, can help detect that and and prevent that. So, um, yeah, things like SIM swapping, uh, MFA fatigue, uh, uh, cookie uh, jacking or session hijacking are just a few of the ways that that you could get around MFA. So, definitely not foolproof. Uh, let's see. Question here: Can you make a comparison to Proofpoint? So, yeah, I mean, of course, Barracuda has been doing email for you know twenty years now. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you would like to talk about how we uh, compare to the competition, we'd be uh, thrilled. I'm sure we have some uh, collateral and, and marketing material on how we compare. So uh, reach on out to us and we'll be happy to get you that info. All right, I'll give another few seconds here to see if there's any other questions. While I give folks some time there, um, it's been a pleasure. I hope uh, hope this was insightful. Hope it was interesting. Um, again, apologies for the technical uh, difficulties. The technical difficulties there in the beginning, but um, turned out to be a good session. I think so. Um, looks like no other questions. So, Kate, I guess we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for the excellent presentation. I definitely agree that. It was very insightful. I definitely learned a lot. Um, and I thank you all for joining us and for sticking around even with the late start. Um, and I wish you all a great rest of your day. And if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And yeah, thank you all. Take care.